This video is brought to you by patreon.com slash worst take. Get access to exclusive live streams and discord servers, on screen shout outs and early access to some videos when you join now. Help make sure that we can continue to make content like this by supporting the Patreon. Links are in the description down below. A ton of things to get into. It's been an eventful week of camp for Browns fans. It's also been an eventful week of camp for, I think, every AFC North team. But the team that's been in the news with the Browns this week, not as much because you didn't announce a new stadium or anything like that, um, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Well, let's just jump into the elephant in the room, the Brandon Ayuk thing. Now, I think this has been hit at a lot of angles. It's been in the in the media so long. Like we've been talking about this since March, um, a potential Ayuk deal. My question to you is: You traded Deontay Johnson in March. It seems like a wide receiver is what's holding this deal up from what we can cobble together. Do you think? It one, I guess it's a two-tier question. One, do you think if you still had Deontay Johnson to dangle in this trade, a thousand yard wide receiver, not like Calvin Austin or something like that, you know, real legit, hey, this guy can hold it down, good route runner, you can do some of the stuff that you can do. Um, to dangle in front of San Francisco, you think this deal probably gets done a lot easier? And two, would that trade off be worth it to get Ayuk knowing that you're not gonna get that fourth in Dante Jackson? Yeah, I mean, it's tough, right? Because the the Dante Jackson, Deontay Johnson deal is kind of interesting because, like, from what I understand is, like, the Steelers are ready to move on from Deontay. Like, that was going to – like, he was probably going to be released. And then kind of on the flip side of that, Dante Jackson was going to be released from Carolina. So it was just a deal that made sense from both sides. Now, I definitely see what you're saying in terms of, like, if if that is the holdup from San Francisco side, if, if they absolutely have to get a wide receiver – Deontay can do some of the stuff in terms of, like you mentioned, as a route runner, being that X, the guy that's on the line, defeating press coverage, can do all those different things. Um, the interesting thing about replacing Ayuk, and I think that San Francisco 49er fans are kind of figuring that out now, is there's not a lot of people that can really do what he can do. And that's really what makes him so special is because not only is he that three-level threat on the perimeter that can win on the ball, he's also a very, very integral part of what they do in the run game. Like they have him in those really tight splits, condensed next to Trent Williams. And like, there's times where he's taking on an edge rusher one-on-one. There's times where they're asking him to come in and crack a linebacker. There's times where he's fitting up a safety um, in the run fit. So the the amount of things that they put on his plate is, it, it's just not really done a ton in the NFL. And that's why I think like, everybody's wondering, well, they drafted two wide receivers. They drafted Ricky Pearsall. They drafted Jacob Callen. Well, neither one of those guys are X's and neither one of those guys can probably handle the load physically that IU can because of his frame and his blocking ability. So I think that makes it difficult. Now I would say like, if the deal was like Deontay Johnson in a second or something like that, like, I think that that's an upgrade. And I, I'm someone that probably is higher than 90 something percent of people on Deontay, but I think that, that is an upgrade worth pursuing because of the added benefits of, Ayuk's a little bit better with the ball in the air. He has a little bit, like, definitely more play strength, gives you the blocking ability in terms of being a little bit better after the catch, too. So, um, I don't know, man. I, I think that the Steelers definitely want a wide receiver upgrade. I just – this is the first time it's actually felt possible since March that they're actually going to deal him. Like, last week when those reports came out that, you know, Cleveland was getting involved. Like, over the past week, this actually seems like there's a legit ch chance that he actually gets moved. Yeah. Now – how long do you think this takes before it just make like, do you think this gets to a point where San Francisco is like, if we can't get what we want, we'll just call this bluff about sure. not playing this year. Like uh, how, how attractive do you think that option is for San Francisco? Given that the negotiations seem to have taken a point to where Pittsburgh's the only one that they can really negotiate with now that it it seems like cleveland's out even though that report the report is that they're still in if there's been a framework <laughs> and a contract offer and he ain't right. there it tells me all i need to know like he probably sure. don't want to be there right so it seems like and then we heard new england was out too i don't know if there's anybody else secretly in there it doesn't seem like even though we're in the we're in the secret part of this where people start just throwing random teams into this 
if it's only Pittsburgh they're able to negotiate with, and we know how Pittsburgh is, we know how John Lynch is, and even before that, it was the Browns in there. The Browns not really one to oversell uh, um, either. So it's like, if you, what do you think makes it worthwhile for San Francisco to go without Ayuk as far as compensation goes? And this is a team that was what? A drive away from winning the Super Bowl last year? Like, I have to imagine they're trying to get better this year or at least the same so they can go back sure. and try to finish. But man, that's what that's what I don't understand about all this. Like everything that we're hearing like behind the scenes and what's being public, what's being said in private, the one thing that I have not been able to figure out is why now? Like what changed in the past couple of weeks or the past couple of months that they would legitimately be fielding offers and like throwing him out there to be had? Like if you're going to trade a guy like this, like you mentioned, they're in a Super Bowl window. The reason why I've said for months, months and months that the Steelers have no shot at getting him, because like once the draft ended, I was like, that's that's over with. It, it's gone because, you know, they're in a Super Bowl window. Anyone that they want to get back in return, they need to be able to help this year. Now, draft pick compensation. That's not going to help you this year. You know, if the Steelers mm-hmm. do send, they send multiple day two picks for Ayuk or whatever, and, and maybe a player in there, that's not going to help their chances to win the Super Bowl this year, which I think is their ultimate goal. And like you said, like, is, is Ayuk pulling that car? He's saying, like, hey, I'm, I'm sitting out portions of games. Like, maybe that's what changed. Um, you know, we, we know about the trade request. But, I mean, this has been an obvious thing. Like, Brandon was going to want to get paid. He's entering the fifth-year option. All these receivers getting paid. The Niners procrastinated. They didn't beat certain guys to the to the market. They didn't beat the Waddle deal. We've seen other guys that, quite frankly, just aren't as good as Brandon get paid in the upper 20s, upwards, you know, up to $30 million a year, and which has made this whole situation really difficult. And I think, like, just there's so many different elements to this trade negotiation that I think are difficult from the contract to the trade compensation to – where the respective teams are in their development, like the Steelers, I think regardless if, if, if it's a reality that's you know going to come true or not, I think they want to win this year too. So the Niners mm-hmm. want to win, the Steelers want to win. Um, you know, there's the contract element, obviously, but I think Brandon's been, I know for a fact that he wants to be in Pittsburgh, but again, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be worked out in order for that to be realized. And I don't know who knows. I'm just, my only request now is that it doesn't linger on until like late next week i want this thing done with so we can get on to you know some actual football discourse i'm sure you feel the same way yeah yeah i I pretty much made the announcement after like the second day that it lingered with the browns i'm like i'm not following this day today. i'm done (laughs) yeah like i'll wait till something actually happens because when you follow this thing day to day it's like when the drake kendrick beef ended and then there was like that weird twitter account that popped up that was like posted and like all right this got too weird for me (laughs) yeah agree um, yeah, so that's that's the turn that this Ayuk thing has taken. I I find this whole situation interesting because, like you mentioned, I think some people think, oh, there's two second round picks that can help them be good for long. But if you look at the 49ers, they're a team that's kind of tired of being really, really good, but not good enough sure. to win a championship. Like, I, so like the appeal of like, hey, you could be good for a longer time. They are kind of on a clock here, too, because what Brock Purdy is a seventh round pick. So that means he has what, two years left on that rookie deal, which means one year left on rookie deal money before you have to really start talking about ponying up an extension. I don't know what the specific rules are for when you aren't a first round draft pick, but it's it's this third year you can start negotiating. Right. Yeah. And that so that's also like another part of this that I think is just adds to the complication of it is like. You know, the Steelers have been willing to include certain players in the deal that could potentially help the Niners this year. Like James Daniels is a name that's been thrown out there um, that we know has actually been put on the table. James Daniels is a good he's a good right guard. Like he's they have a bunch of young guards on their roster, but Daniels is probably better right now. But the problem is Daniels is an impending free agent. That's why Pittsburgh would be probably willing to deal him in a deal like this. The problem is like he needs a new contract too. the Niners have a lot of guaranteed money already tied up and like they're they're real core players. And then, like you mentioned, they've got a quarterback contract that's coming due probably next offseason. So I think that's the other part of it is like, yeah, they would like to get someone back that could help them this year. But I think that the the whole deal with like not paying Ayuk is they just have a really expensive roster because that's what happens. Like when you get in these like Super Bowl windows and your roster gets absolutely loaded, like even with the seventh round quarterback, 
you know, they've got all these superstars on both sides of the ball. That's what happens. Like when your roster gets really, really good, it gets really expensive and you can't pay everybody. And even though mm-hmm. if I'm in San Francisco's shoes, Ayuk would be someone that I would pay. And like if my general manager said that we were going to deal him, I would probably fire him just because I this is not someone that I would want to lose. Um, but at the same time, like I understand, like you got to make those tough decisions as a as an organization. It just makes it really difficult when you're in these types of trade talks. I'll throw a name out there and tell me you think this gets the deal done or if Pittsburgh would be willing to do it. You think okay. they're willing to throw Jalen Warren in that deal? Because I would love if you guys, from a Browns fan's perspective, I would love if y'all got rid of Jalen Warren. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's funny, man, because, uh, you know, I had Patrick Queen on my channel, and I, I've talked to different guys, like, on the Steelers roster. Jalen's like, dude, Jalen's just a pest, man. He's a pain. He's a pain to go up against. And, like, even uh, I got to go to training camp. Uh, to see them do backs on backers. So it's just like a one-on-one pass protection drill. And, you know, he's going head up with Alandon Roberts. And, like, Alandon Roberts, like, pure thumper. Like, he's pure power. Mm-hmm. There's no moves. Like, he's just trying to run straight through your face. And he ran straight through Jalen, cracked his visor. Jalen gets right back up. He he wants a do-over. They go back at it. Jalen just tosses him to the ground, starts standing over him. He's, like, five foot eight, 220, just, no, like, all muscle, man, and, like, just starts running his mouth. So, yeah, I know a lot of people would like to see Jalen outside the AFC North, but I think he's somebody that uh, the Steelers are probably going to try to keep. <laughs> Do you think the Steelers – well, I don't think Najee would make sense to throw into that deal because he's somebody who kind of yeah. has to start and you're not going to use him in tandem with somebody like C-Mac. Like, we know that George Pickens is not going to be on the table, right? Like, that's sure. obvious. <laughs> um, and then, like, I would imagine Highsmith off the board – Obviously, Watt, maybe if you get super desperate, you could think about Minka, but I wouldn't like consider Minka in there. That's a huge part of what makes you special on defense. And you got a corner. You got corners just so you can make sure that Minka can do what Minka sure. does. So it really wouldn't make sense to put him in. Like, who do you think you could throw in there that Pittsburgh might be willing to be move that would get this deal done for Pittsburgh? So, so like, that's the thing is like, I, I know that. Daniels is like, like they drafted a fourth round guard, Mason McCormick. Um, and mm-hmm. then they have some interior depth. Uh, Nick Herbick has actually played pretty well. Um, or Nate Herbick, excuse me. He's actually played pretty well at center right now. He's holding off Zach Frazier, who they drafted. So, I mean, they drafted three offensive linemen. They've got decent depth to where if they lost Daniels, like it's definitely not preferred, but in order to bring in a play like playmaker, especially as IU, I think you could, you definitely can make the you know decision to do that. The problem is, like I said, I think, there's only certain players that probably make sense for San Francisco. Like you mentioned, uh, Pickens, like a lot of people have thrown that out because I think they're a uh, Cooper got through out on your all side. So it's like now everybody's saying that like, maybe it's, it's Pickens and a pick, but like just from being in Pittsburgh, the sewers are super, super high on George Pickens. Like not just for like obvious reasons, but like he's a rookie. He's cost controlled for two more years. They very much believe that he's like, uh, wide receiver one like bar none they think he's super talented which i i tend to agree um you just want to see a little bit more development from a route running standpoint like put more on his shoulders this year which they're interested in finding out but this is about this trade for iu is about finding a really top tier partner for george more than it is like oh we got to upgrade you know what i'm saying because like the wide receiver two spot after they dealt Deontay is the, that is the big question mark. Like right now it's between mm-hmm. like Van Jefferson. He's basically playing like the Z they got Calvin Austin kind of rotating between uh, in the slot and the Z as well. That That's your 11 personnel wide receivers. And I think that like even the most unbiased Steelers fans or the, excuse me, the most biased Steeler fans would tell you like, that's not enough to compete in the AFC. Yeah. Like, that's just not enough firepower. Maybe, maybe like a guy like Mahomes could make that work, but like, it's just not enough. Like when you've got two quarterbacks that you're very much trying, like you're trying to revive Russell Wilson's career, you're trying to, um, you know, fix Justin Fields, whatever. Like you got to give those guys some playmakers to work with. And right now, that's not really on the roster. So, I think, um, you know, it, it's definitely tough. But Daniels would be the only name that would kind of make sense. Um, otherwise, I think it's going to be just a lot of draft capital um, in return. And again, like that may not be good enough for the Niners, but I'm not really sure that they like what else they're going to get um, at this stage in the ball game because they waited so long to start the negotiations. Yep. All right, let's move on to quarterbacks because you kind of mm-hmm. mentioned them. Um, in quarterbacks in situations like this, and look, I'm a Browns fan. I've lived through all the quarterback situations <laughs> you can manufacture. Right. There's always this 
this lingering argument that you have to have with yourself whenever you're evaluating what your team is going to do with the quarterback, because there is what is obvious to the public and what pub the public thinks. And then there is what, was sold in private to the ownership or what was sold in private with, with the people who make these decisions. And with the Russ Justin Fields thing, I just am fascinated to know what the conversations were individually for both of those moves because I have heard a lot of different things, right? I think the assumption is, oh, Russ going to take over. Russ going to take over at the beginning of the season, kind of like if you drafted a rookie, Justin Fields going to come in. Then I hear reports from people in Pittsburgh there saying, no, the ideal is to give Russ a real shot. And if he plays well, we're thinking about extending him. And it just brings me back to that thing. It's like, where is like Omar Khan and ownership with Russ? Like, do they still? And I think this is the big thing for Pittsburgh and the big thing to determine how the Russ experiment is going to go is do they still see that as Russell Wilson or do they see that as a dude who's 35 who's starting for $1 million this year? Because if they see it like that, then the things that people say about it being an upgrade over Kenny Pickett, technically, and that the offense is going to be a little bit better, you're still going to focus on what you need to focus on. I think those things can be true. But if they're looking at this like, no, that's Russ, then that changes things, right? Remember how the last years of Ben, where it's like people thought that they're just going to run the ball, and Ben was out there throwing 40, 50 times a game still, because it's Ben. And I wonder, where are they? Where Where's Arthur Smith with that? Where is the team with that? Like, do they think that's still Russ? Or do are they just saying, hey, this is, who, are they thinking about this like it's Jacoby Brissett out there? Um, right. Like in Russell Wilson's body. Like, is, I'm, I'm really interested to know what the perspective is coming out of camp is with Pittsburgh on that. Yeah, it's really difficult because I definitely think that they sold Russ on the, on the idea that, this was a roster that needed a quarterback upgrade, but if they got a quarterback upgrade, they could compete. And I think that that's what made it intriguing for him on his side. Now, the thing about Russ that I think you have to really understand, and you would know this a lot more, and I'm sure you educate like your viewership over here on YouTube as well, but like certain quarterbacks, like once you get to a certain caliber, a lot of the media narrative can be shifted by things that your people say, like what you're talking about with like, Oh, the Steelers want to extend Russ, like whatever that that uh, report like came out from multiple reporters, like almost immediately after Justin Fields, the trade went through and both guys have said the right things, like in terms of like, mm -hmm. hey, we're going to come in here and compete. The organization's been very like transparent to the public in terms of like, hey, we're going to make this a legit quarterback competition. Russ is like the starter right now. He's got pole position. That's the term that they've used really since March. Um, but Justin like has a chance to make it interesting. And here's the deal too, like with the calf injury that Russ has been dealing with over the past two weeks, he just now returned to practice. Like it's given Justin like two weeks of training camp of live reps to work with the first team offense. Like he's developed a rapport with George Pickens. Like those two are familiar with each other from back in high school, but like those two really started to click over the last week. Justin's played like they his played best in college ball. together too, right? Because Justin bit, said they one year at Georgia, right? Yeah. And I think too, um, you know, now Justin gets the start tonight. Russ is sitting out um, against the Texans. So it they're giving Justin opportunities, I think, to shine so much that we don't have a choice but to keep like we don't have a choice to keep but to keep you on the bench or to start you I should say um, but mm -hmm. I ultimately think it's going to be Russ to start the season but my whole thought process on this whole thing has been the Steelers knew they needed to upgrade a quarterback that was like painfully obvious last season I think I remember coming on your channel to state literally that um, but I think that they took two really cheap shots in the dark and even even though I do have skepticism over either guy really being like the long term solution, I do think that they can both provide in their own unique kind of ways, short term upgrades. And then like, you know, both these guys are on one year deals. You don't owe them anything after the season. You see what you got in both guys and how the season plays out. And, you know, hopefully it works out with one of them to where you want to hit your wagon to them for a couple more years. If not, you just again, you just keep rolling the dice. And I think that's like. That's what I've appreciated about their approach is like, don't settle for potential mediocrity. Maybe Kenny Pickett could mm -hmm. be the 20th best quarterback in the league eventually, but like, don't settle for that. You can go take these two cheap shots and see what you got out of either of these quarterbacks. And then if it doesn't work, you just keep trying again. Like, that's what you have to do. You got to find the quarterback eventually, especially with a roster that's, you know, getting a little bit up there in age. So we'll see. 
Yeah, that's the that's the trickiest part um, with yeah. getting a quarterback, keeping a quarterback, is the resisting timelines. the urge to marry yourself to mediocrity, right? Because yeah. it's, the worst it's thing really you can tempting do in urge. Yeah, it's the it's the most tempting urge. It's like, oh, okay, we go marry. Like, it, it makes me wonder about like the Miami thing where it's like. I'm iffy on exactly. Tua, but yeah. it's like sixty million for two wide receivers to elevate Tua plus Tua. So you're you're ending up spending what? It's Tua's fifty. That's sixty. It's a hundred and ten million dollars on three players, and you don't have any faith that that's enough to get you past Pat Mahomes. Like nobody is looking at yeah. that. Like yeah, man, Pat's in trouble. Like that's yeah. a that's a layup in round one if Pat has to play them. Um so it's it's just tough, right? Because quarterback play is hard. And I say this all the time when people were comparing like Kenny Pickett to like Andy Dalton. I'm like, is Andy Dalton mediocre? Yes. But also mediocre at the quarterback position is rare. Yeah. What is usually gonna happen with most of these guys that get drafted in the first round is they they're usually bad. Out, like, yeah, they're usually like <laughs> that's just bad, really bad. Like, just like yeah. okay, they're like on somebody's practice squad, or like, they're that's the thing. like a third. That's string. why organizations do the things that they do in terms of like paying sixty dollars for above average quarterbacks like Tua, mm-hmm. and you know, like Tua has some re- redeeming qualities, and like he can do some things that I think do help elevate that offense. But at the same time, like, like you said, man, I just. I, I am glad that they didn't waste another year and use like the offensive coordinator as an excuse or anything like that. Like my number one priority, like once the season ended, it was like, okay, like you've got this defense, there's a core guys, they're getting a little bit older. Like you have to get serious about trying to upgrade the offensive coordinator, like get someone that's actually had legitimate NFL success, not some college dude who's bounced around the collegiate ranks for two decades, not someone that has run across paths with Tomlin over the last 15, 20 years. Like you need someone that's had success. Arthur Smith's tenure in Atlanta didn't go great, but you know, he had the run in Tennessee for two years. That was pretty good. I think Smith's identity and what he wants to do on offense matches what Tomlin wants right now, especially with the quarterbacks that they have. They want to be a heavy uh, run team. They want to utilize play action, take shots over the top. Um, and I think that there's a there's a world where the Steelers can be competitive. But, you know, like people were asking me, like, OK, if the Steelers get IU, are they contenders? And it's like I can't answer that until I believe in one of the quarterbacks. Like hopefully, you mm. know, a month or two into the season, like one of these guys has given me enough to say, like, OK, like if things strike the right way and these guys get hot, like, OK, like maybe they can go and compete with the Kansas cities of the world. But until like I'm confident in the quarterback, that's absolutely not happening. And like I think that's the. That's the unfortunate part about sports or about the NFL or following football is like you can build these like really good rosters. You can have all pro talents. You can have the TJ Watts. You can have the Miles Garrett's. But like until you get the quarterback in place, really doesn't matter, unfortunately, because you got guys like Patrick Mahomes and and Tom Brady that are going to rule, you know, the majority of the championships. So it's 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 a tough spot to be in. Yeah, it's still, I feel like the art of winning the playoffs in the NFL doesn't get enough attention. Cause like oh, yeah. you, we have all these like basic sayings like, oh, champion, well, defense wins championships or whatever. People argue about that. True. And to me, it's like, you have to be an extremely balanced and versatile team to win a championship because yeah. you're going to be actually four games ways. in a row. Yeah. And you have to win so many different ways. And that's where I get to like the wide receiver conversation or when you're talking about allocating that much money to three guys, it's like you're yeah. stringing yourself in. You have to win that way in order to get to the Super Bowl. And you're saying you got to win that way four times. Like the question yeah. isn't, it's got to be, is are those three guys good enough to carry you against four best teams four times in a row, no matter what happens? And I think that's where you run into issues when you start, um, especially if you're, like, trying to be a contending team, um, sure. paying, like, wide receivers, like, 35, 36. It's like, if you really, like, you must have the best rookie deal lineup of, like, players, <laughs> if sure. that's the case, because you're going to get hamstrung. You're going to get stuck in a position where they're going to ask you to po- play power football. You can't do it. You ain't got the guy. Yep. Um, so it, it, it's that game, too, that you have to balance. And I think the quarterback helps you so much because the quarterback is in control of how you can win those multiple ways, even if it's a run game thing. Like, the quarterback's important to the run game, right? Like, you need somebody smart to look over it. But when you look at this Steelers team, it's an upgraded team. And I think the most intriguing player that you guys have added is Patrick Quinn. 
because I think some people are so many different places on Pat. I think sometimes it has to do with, I think people give Roquan Smith a little bit too much, not a little bit. I think people give Roquan Smith, like they basically talk about it as if Roquan Smith Bro, like breathed greatness into Patrick Queen's lungs, and that's the only reason Patrick Queen has ever had success. And if you take him away from Roquan Smith, he's going to be awful. But when I watched him last year, I'm like, well, this is a guy who had some ups and downs his early career. Roquan sure. Smith comes there. I bet it does help to have a steady guy like Roquan Smith in there, a playmaker, somebody who can who's been there for a while. But. You look at the improvements that Pat Queen has made, like as a playmaker with his instincts, and it's impossible for me to say, well, it's Roquan, really, that that's controlling that. Like, I see yeah. a really solid linebacker there, um, and I think that's going to be an interesting addition to Pittsburgh because you guys have a nice rotation of linebackers, right? Um, and Landon Roberts used to talk about it, real good run thumper. Like, you got guys who can take care of the boring stuff. Sure. So Pat Queen doesn't have to do that. And I think it's a similar situation where Pat's going to be able to do a little bit more, and he's going to be asked to be a coverage more, which I thought he did a good job of last year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's there's been so many bad narratives, man. And, like, it, it really frustrates me because, like, the more I started to dig into it, the more I started to dig into his film. And then, you know, I posted his film room and, like, there's even people, like, responding to that in, like, the comments with just, like, really bad narratives of stuff that just were really outdated takes. And then, you know, I got to have PQ on my channel and we, we talked for, you know, half an hour or so and i've talked to him several times since most recently on the fr at the friday night lights practice but one of the things i think people are missing with that is like patrick was one of the youngest players we've ever seen at the nfl level he was 20 years old when he made his nfl debut he came in during the COVID off season so like we know how weird that was like you didn't have like the same uh access to the facilities like everything was completely different and like he was playing for wink martindale who has a very difficult system to digest for young guys and you know then like all of these things happen to where like mike mcdonald comes in during his like third year or whatever he you know gets a lot better that coincides with the timing of like them trading for roquan smith but like people act like it's the craziest thing ever like pq really started trending upward when he was 23 years old we have guys coming out of the draft that are 23 <laughs> like it it's like it's like what, joe bell is 24 <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, what are we what are we talking about? Like this kid, this this dude is literally 23 years old, man, finding his footing in the league. And then like he last year, he he absolutely balled out. And I think, you know, and he was very complimentary, of course, like and Roquan's been really complimentary of, of Pat, too. But mm -hmm. those guys, he was really complimentary about what Roquan did to his development in terms of like when he came out of LSU, he wasn't used to reading like three man route concepts in coverage so like that was a completely new thing because the college world's different like a lot of times like you're not seeing as many like five out combinations you're not you're more seeing like half field reads and things like that he got mm -hmm. to the nfl and like this is completely different he didn't play a lot in college so like he had to learn a lot roquan you know he he told me that like roquan helped him like develop those instincts and like understand like how to watch film and like just how to like how the nfl game is different and then like i feel like once his mind started to catch up in year three. That's when you start seeing his athleticism really shine through, which was really his calling card and what made him so appealing to get drafted in the first round. So, I mean, he's not a perfect player. Like, there's definitely things that I feel like he can still improve on. And, like, he knows that too. And in order for him to really pay off that contract, like, he's going to have to be a pretty solid player in coverage. But, like, based on what I saw on film last year, I think they can get a good return on investment. And uh, just being at camp, man, like, dude, they tried so many screens. I, they tried so many screens and like scrimmages and team periods and stuff. And he was just blowing everything up. Like he was just completely erasing everything just because like sideline to sideline, his range is just unreal. So I'm excited about PQ. I, I, I think I agree with you. I think a lot of the narratives surrounding him as a player, are just really outdated, like honestly, like really lazy takes to my, to be honest. Yeah, I know I was talking to Ace, who covers the Bengals. And he was telling me, dog, when you ask the players who hit the hardest, they be talking about Pat Queen. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just I, I, that happens a lot of times where it's like, especially at positions where it's difficult to really understand what the value p uh, play is of, of a player sure. play to yeah. play. It becomes about media narrative, and I think the narrative kind of became about Roquan Smith in Baltimore, 
and I think Roquan Smith was a part of that, right? I'm kind of known as a Roquan Smith sure. hater yeah, really or, or whatever it is. Player. He's a really good player. Uh, but the idea that, like, okay, that one person came in and changed everything about a defense, that's just that you could be Miles Garrett. And that's not the case, right? You could be TJ yeah. Watt, and that's not the case. So it's it's usually a number of different things. There's like, okay, well, Matabuke probably was starting to play better, getting to his own. We saw him break yeah. out, right? When you have better defensive line play, that usually helps you up front. Maybe Roquan being there does unlock some things that Pat can do differently. And Roquan sure. does give him some insight, but he's learned now. Like he, like you mentioned, 23 years old. There are players where David and Joku broke out. He was 28. Right? Yeah, like, I mean, these, it takes a while sometimes. It, it, it's crazy to me too that like people don't still don't understand that like sometimes it just takes guys a little bit longer. And like that's not yeah. even I mean that's not rocket science or some crazy take. Like you just have to understand if you draft these guys super young and they're going to be twenty one year old rookies, like they're they're not as far along on their development path. Like they still got a lot of runway left. And I mean it, it is what it is. I think also some some of that too, like that we saw like this off season is just the Ravens fans being bitter that somebody's going from Baltimore to Pittsburgh. And like, mm -hmm. I completely understand that. I mean, like, I feel like you and I, even though like we cover our respective teams, we at least know enough ball to not be completely, you know, to where we're overly biased and like, Oh, everything Cleveland's the best thing ever. Everything Pittsburgh's the best thing ever. <laughs> That's just not, I mean, I, I just, I've never been like that even before I started doing content and stuff, but um, it, it's just annoying to me because it's like all these like Ravens fans and stuff acting like he's trash and it's just like y'all 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 didn't believe this six months ago like y'all are lying you are lying on the internet y'all were just lying, talking so. about how deserved that Pro Bowl died and the all yeah. pro stuff was it is like now he's garbage like so <laughs> it, haters, it is is yeah it's crazy. like. Well, there's two types of people who get into this, right? There's people who like football and then have a favorite team, and then there's people who have a favorite team, and that's why they like football, right? And yeah. I I liked football before I liked the Browns. It's like, okay, sure. you you love the game, so that's what you appreciate about it. And when you love the game, you got to be honest about the game. Um, and that means being positive about guys who are playing well that some people don't like. That means being negative about, you know, some fan favorites because a lot of times that happens where it's fan favorite playing well, and it's like, hey, bro. Sure. Ain't what you think it is, right? And it's a tough conversation to have. Um, but yeah, the Pat Queen one, definitely an interesting conversation. As far as Pittsburgh goes this year, I have two questions about Pittsburgh's offense. Is this the year where Jalen Ward gets more touches than Najee? I mean, it, it's very possible. I mean, I, I think that there is, like we talked about narratives, like there's this idea that Jalen's the outside runner and now she's the inside runner that's like it's just not backed <laughs> up in facts or stats like you can look at the numbers like you just look at their outside zone wide zone numbers their mid zone numbers from last year like it it's just not really backed up i think that they're both really better as like downhill runners so that's what makes mm -hmm. the scheme fit kind of interesting for both of them that they're going to this wide zone mid zone uh offense under art smith but i mean there, there's definitely a possibility right like they declined the option for Najee. they i mean yeah he's the first round pick they no longer have like an obligation really to keep him as like the workhorse or the one a guy um but having said that, like, I do think that Najee has almost become like a little bit old or a little bit underrated just because in like Steeler circles, because he's not great with the media, not overly engaging with the fan base. And I think like some of what has been misconstrued is like you look at like the yards per carry numbers and all this stuff like Najee's carries come in different settings so like they're they're different times of the game like you're looking at different box counts Jalen I think has a has a right to maybe being a better runner but like we've also never seen Jalen have to carry the load to carry like 20 something reps a game where he's getting all the first down work and stuff like that um but I think it's definitely possible I mean I, I think that Jalen's gonna Jalen's a restricted free agent after the season I think that they would ideally like to keep him if it's uh cost friendly um but yeah, I definitely think it's possible that he could outsnap Najee for sure. And how long do you think Russ holds off Justin? I'm betting till October. Mm, man, I think it. I think it. That, yeah, I, I'm betting because Pittsburgh is stubborn enough. Yeah. To be like, <laughs> we're gonna do this, and usually what happens is Pittsburgh holds on long enough to where you actually start to believe they're just gonna stubborn their way through this, and yeah. then they finally like two weeks after you get to that point. You they finally go, you know what? We're gonna start giving Justin Fields reps. So I, that's what six, seven weeks into the season. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of it probably depends on how Justin plays in preseason. Like, I, I, I mean, Mike Tom was very candid about that being, you know, preseason games. Like, the actual in-game bullets matter more than the practices do. So, Justin's got a great opportunity ahead of him. Selfishly, I think that the in my eyes and my vision, I think that Arthur Smith could expand his offense and expand the quarterback run game with Justin. And I think you could get a quality offense around Justin utilizing his legs combined with all the other things that they can already do on offense. That being said, I think Russ does offer them more stability because even though I think maybe Russ's floor is being a little bit overrated, I feel like by the masses right now, Justin's floor is still like dangerously low because he puts the ball on the turf way too much with the fumbles. He takes a lot of sacks. They actually have a lot of the same weaknesses in terms of like their pocket navigation, where, where they like to target on the field, where they don't like to target on the field. They're both really good deep ball throwers, uh, but neither one of them like to throw in between the, in between the hashes and between the numbers much. So I don't know. I've kind of thought about it in terms of like, I think of us probably gets to like week seven, week eight as well. But I mean, who knows? Their schedule in the early portion of the year is a lot lighter than it is down the stretch. So that's one thing that I think he has going for him. Assuming he starts week one, he's going to have like a little bit easier of a of a go of it before they get into all these divisional games down the stretch. But I think, and maybe this is just foolish for me because I think it is really difficult to change who a quarterback is going into year four and his sec- on his second team. But like, I'm just still holding on to like just a little bit of that upside with Justin. And that's what makes me a little bit more intrigued where I feel like Russ at this point in his career, he's always been a very unique player who has very specific strengths and weaknesses. I just don't think that there's any more upside to what Russ is. He just kind of is what he is. And I'm just a little bit more intrigued by Russ or Justin, but we'll see. I'll I'll say like midway through the season though. I think Justin's going to start. All right. And do you think you could get more out of Justin Fields than what Arthur Smith got out of Marcus Mariota in 21? Yes, I do. I, and I, that's kind of what I mentioned with like the quarterback run game stuff. Like he started doing some stuff. I actually got to talk to Arthur Smith about this co- uh, last week, but he started doing some different stuff with his offense. They went really pistol heavy and the pistol's really good. Mm. He got his own re quarterback and that was something that they liked. It also gets the backs downhill quicker. But I think that that's kind of the idea with Justin. I think like if you put him in there, like I think you can get even more. You can really lean into the pistol. You can lean into the heavy personnel. You can do the play action shot plays. But also, like I would like to see, you know, Art runs like 80 something percent zone runs. Like I would like to see him incorporate some more gap stuff so that you can get some of these pullers because Pittsburgh's drafted a bunch of good pullers in the recent years. Get some good pullers and then like really open up the quarterback run game. Like, GT counter, like run, run some power with him. Like, because that's the thing, like I'm skeptical about him as like a long-term option, just because I I don't know if he's ever going to get there as a passer and to like be a legitimate starter for a long time in the league. You have to, but win you can get like a, like a quick get, season or two out of that. Yes, yeah. yeah. Like you can absolutely, I, I really do believe it and not just me, like leaning into my own biases. Like I really do believe you, you can have like a functional solid NFL offense with Justin under center if you utilize him in the run game the way that I think Chicago did at times, but maybe not nearly as consistent enough. But I, I, right, think, well, I think it could be good. All right, well, Derek, thank you for coming on. Always appreciate the insight about the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, you know, maybe next year when you guys trade for Brandon Ayuk, we'll figure out <laughs> how to talk about this. <laughs> wait, I can't. Wait, you don't s- make me wait another year, man. I can't do it. I'm not <laughs> engaging in any more Brandon IU conversations after this preseason. I'm I'm making a rule for myself. Was that dread? Was that Dr. Dre album? They said was never coming. Was it the Chronic? That's <laughs> what it is. Yeah. Out? yeah, it's the it's the new Chronic. It's the new Kendrick album. It's like okay, when one. is it coming out? It's never coming out. <laughs> like, it's a good one. That that's what it feels like. Um, hopefully, with our luck, we'll upload this video and then boom, all of a sudden the trade would have happened. Video immediately out of day. Uh, but thank you for coming on, Derek. Appreciate you. Uh, you have a great day. Everybody else have a good night. Peace.